Good, good, good afternoon, everybody. And we are here back at API Days Interface 2021. My name is Vincenzo Ghanese. I'm writing you from New York with 95 Fahrenheit degrees. So it's kind of very hot. Um, and we're back with a lot more. Uh, so without any further ado, I'm going to be inviting on, this, on the stage next speaker, Boris Arnoff. Let's see if we can have you here right now with us. Hello. How are you? Hello, Boris. I'm doing OK. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Where are you? Where are you connecting with us from? Where are you based? Uh, I'm based in New Jersey, which is kind of close to New York, close I think to your We're location. actually very close, indeed. Yes. All right. So I think you're, uh, most likely you're, you're you're having my same pain and suffering with the heating at the moment. Whenever you go outside. Yeah, it's a little bit warmer than I would like to be. Ah, all right. Very good. So Boris is a Chief architect at ADP, and today is going to be sharing with us his experiences in building contextualized API specification. So, Boris, the stage is yours. And uh, for the people that are that are that are on the audience, remember that you can ask questions all the time in the chat. I'm going to be monitoring it, and then um, submit the the questions to the speaker. Enjoy the talk and take it away, Boris. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to building contextualized specs or one size does not fit all session. My name is Boris Vernov. I'm a part of the ADP Enterprise Architecture responsible for the API governance program across the organization. Nowadays, APIs are the foundation of any integration as well as any digital transformation. Thus, the API specifications are quickly becoming a very important component of the company's public image. Many large companies, including ADP, expose a broad variety of capabilities targeted to different consumers. This session focuses on creating and exposing contextualized API specifications based on the type of a consumer and their access entitlements. Many of you are probably familiar with ADP as a company since you're receiving your paychecks or tax forms with the ADP logo. But ADP as a company has much broader spectrum of services. It serves many clients all over the world that includes millions of users and offers a broad variety of human capital and payroll solutions. It's a known fact that uh, ADP strength is data. We used to joke that data is our middle name. That's what D stands for in a company name. And indeed, ADP covers all areas of the workforce management from job search to retirement, payroll, tax, benefits, and everything around it. And naturally, that all pieces of the puzzle are connected through the APIs. Let me continue with the quote of the day uh, from Satya Nadella, Microsoft CEO. Every company is a software company. Every company is a digital organization. Many years ago, ADP started as a service company, literally delivering payroll documents to its customers. Before joining a function, I was a part of the ADP Innovation Labs, and that's where the API journey actually began. One of my colleagues was presenting at a conference, and when he introduced himself and his position, somebody from the audience asked, ADP Innovation Labs, huh? How can I put words innovation and ADP in the same sentence? Well, this was company's perception at some point, but over the past 10, 15 years, the company has successfully transformed from the service company using technology into software company providing services. As a software company providing services, ADP grew through acquisitions, which resulted in having many different products built on different platforms, platforms using different technology stack. As a result, it became very difficult to integrate across multiple products. So API everything has become a natural motto of the company. Here's a <clears throat> high level overview of the ADP API journey that started with the data synchronization across multiple products, first use of the APIs. Then ADP mobile solution, which was delivered in a very aggressive timeline and is constantly gaining popularity. Later, the APIs exposed externally enabled a direct access to ADP data and capabilities. So the marketplace was born. And finally, each product has gone through a complete tech refresh or digital transformation to ensure that every product is an API is API enabled. Let's take a look at the company's service expansion. 
As I said before, it started with a handful of products or providers delivering data to mobile customers. Then the external exposure, direct API consumption by a marketplace came into the picture. More and more customers belonging to different industries uh, were interested in mobile solutions, as well as direct access to data and capabilities via APIs. The geographical landscape has expanded as well. Remember, 740,000 clients over 140 countries. And on the top of this already complicated picture, additional products and services became available. Remember, we grew through acquisitions. It's no secret that one of the main factors of the API adoption, and as a result, the success of the entire API program is consistency of API contracts or similar look and feel. Indeed, the contract consistency is the key, but there are so many different use cases and types of consumers. There are partners who serve multiple clients. There are also direct clients accessing data directly. Within each type of organization, there are developers who need to have specific implementation details, sandbox to try, and all the technical details possible. There are business analysts <clears throat> looking for various usage scenarios to be able to address the specific requirements. And there are product owners that are researching capabilities, thus looking for elaborate descriptions. So the question becomes, can the same specification offer the same value and be as useful to different clients and also different types of users within each client organization? Or in other words, does one size fit all when it comes to API specification? Let's try to find an answer and look at some of the challenges that an HCM or human capital management field. I'm sure those uh, challenges are not just specific to HCM area, they're specific to different, they're applicable to different areas as well, but that's where, where IEP operates. When we define a standard object or entity, its definition may need to be projected both globally and regionally. It may need to be projected to a specific industry and possibly to a specific client. I don't mean to sound too pragmatic, but most of the companies are in the business of making money and monetizing KPIs is becoming a sizable portion of the company's revenue. Once we realize there could be different contexts, it becomes clear that the requirements can and will vary. The applicability of data, the constraints, the valid values, and the relevant operations, anything can vary. Let's take another look at the different context dimensions. Uh, different providers can offer different scale or flavor of service. The government rules and regulations will differ for different ge geopolitical regions. Thus, some attributes can become non-applicable or even prohibited by law. Different industries may require different emphasis, such as clock punching workers versus full-time or special benefits for working in hazardous environments. And finally, the consumers that can be internal or external, be a partner serving multiple clients or a direct client. Remember, these are just few basic pillars, and the context can certainly be granularized more. Uh, let's uh, refresh in our memory what are the main components of any API specification. We at ADP use Open API Specs 3.0, formerly known as Swagger, uh, but it could be different formats such as RAML, uh, to define URIs, headers, parameters, responses, descri and descriptions for the entire specifications as well as the individual operations. The Open API Specs can also include extensions to support business rules, elaborate use case descriptions, nicely formatted via mark markdowns. Uh, references to additional documentation, models, sequences, and interaction diagrams. It's hard to argue that the main component of the API definition uh, is the payload, typically described by the schema. Let's be realistic. Most of the industries are heavily regulated, and the data becomes not just an asset, but often also a liability. So a simple payload validation against the schema can become the first level of defense to avoid many problems in the future. And last but certainly not least, the examples illustrating the API usage. Honestly speaking, in many cases, the difference between a good and a bad specification can be meaningful real life example versus mm, I just threw some data together. 
Now, when the problem is identified and the main components of the API specification are refreshed, let's try to come up with a solution. Based on extensive research and working together with different user groups and subject matter experts, here are the some basic pillars that we felt are needed to achieve our goals. That includes dynamically updated context-aware developers portal, access what you're entitled to and what is relevant to you, tailored or contextualized API documentation presented to the specific user based on the entitlements and the current context, centralized API specification data store, or as we call it, API registry, capable, capable of generating API specification on demand based on the user entitlements. It's important to mention that API registry is also integrated into the infrastructure. So the specs become one of the configuration sources to drive the integrations within the company as well as outside, providing, for example, functional authorizations to API gateway and marketplace, schemas to enable message validation at the gateway, and most importantly, at the enterprise service bus, uh, in case of asynchronous communications, where performance impact of validation is not so critical. And finally, routing information to the API gateway, which provider to route to, since there could be more than one provider offering the same solution. Uh, here is the high level diagram demonstrating the API portal access flow. It starts with the user authentication to the API portal uh, if the partner is detected, the choice of contexts would be offered so the partner can choose a context. Based on the selected feature and requested context, the API provider uh, would be identified by the API registry, and the user would be directed to the customized API portal that also supports different access modes, uh, editor and viewer. Uh, editor is typically on the provider side where the user can actually edit the specification and a viewer in the consumer side who can mostly view the specifications. And finally, here are some of the roles defined so far, which we'll review in the next slide, but just a quick overview. It would be API consumer uh, on the client and partner company and the client or partner company, API designer on the provider side, API architect, which is a center of enablement, uh, user and API registry admin. Now, let's take a closer look at the entitlements for each role. We'll start with the API consumer, which will be mostly reading the specs. Uh, next, uh, let's, talk, let's take a look at the partner organization, um, <clears throat> where the user can choose a context to work with. And uh, this part, remember, this partner can serve multiple clients, so the context is important. The API designer at the provider side, who in addition to reading, should also be able to clone the existing canonical and possibly other that were already contextualized specifications and define new, more granular contexts within its own provider. It is important to know that uh, within each organization or consumer, there could be different types of users, more technical and more business oriented who potentially could be interested in a different view of the same specification, more technical details versus more elaborate use case descriptions. And the same applies to the API provider. The business analyst made the specification descriptions and summaries after a technical person completes the technical aspects of the specification. These sub roles are not shown here, but they certainly kept in mind to allow for, to allow for future fine tuning the user experience. Next one is the API architect, who is essentially a super user. In addition to the roles above, it can also create new contexts, create contextualized specs in any context, and if most importantly, define new and modify existing canonical specification templates. And uh, last but not least, let's uh, um, API registry administrator who would manage users and entitlements and manage and maintain CICD pipelines. Let's remember that. Uh, as I mentioned before, the API registry is a part of the overall infrastructure and the specs drive the integrations. Thus, they are subject to weekly builds, QA certification, and deployment to different environments. So DevOps and CACD aspect becomes rather essential. So we are ready 
to drive to dive into the API specification contextualization. So let the fun begin. We start with creating a new context, assuming the canonical specification was already chosen. Once we select the API provider uh, for a given feature, uh, we can narrow the context to a certain geopolitical region and also a certain industry if it's applicable. Few simple questions are answered and voila, a new context is created. Of course, the specs still need to be adjusted for a given context as per our next steps message, such as titles, descriptions, schema adjustments, and other. Here's an example of how the dashboard showing multiple contexts could look like. The access entitlements are not really applied here, so all contexts are shown. Uh, here is the context for a single provider. Here is the context for the provider and uh, applicable to a certain geopolitical region. And here is canonical templates that are not context specific. The canonical version of the API spec is the one that should really be used as a template to create a contextualized version. Technically, any version could be used as a template, but the canonical would be the most complete as the existing contextualized specs may and most likely will have limited representations, hidden operations, pruned schemas, updated descriptions, etc. So I already mentioned something about contextualization, but now let's uh, see what it actually means to contextualize an API specification. We start with selecting the supported operations, since there are certain use cases when different capabilities could be offered based on subscription or the level of service purchased. This step would also include updating descriptions and parameters, and also header and parameter obligation could differ for different providers, especially setting defaults if the uh, parameter value is missing. Usage scenarios. Often, business users are more interested in how a particular operation is integrated in a larger business process. So the scenarios allow for grouping requests and potentially different responses together. And, and providing, as I said, specific examples. Uh, here's the slide demonstrating the operation selection. As you can see on the left side, you have available operations per canonical definition. And on the right side, you see the operation selected for a given context. And the next screen uh, allows for updating the operation descriptions, subject to review and ensure, to ensure the original meaning is preserved. Since ADP grew through acquisitions, the companies that actually later became products were often acquired with their own customer base who would be used to certain terminology. So different providers may use different names to refer to the same business terms, kind of synonyms. These synonyms could be and would be defined in a business glossary. So a CUA reviewer could re refer to it to ensure apples are not called oranges and vice versa. Uh, this is just illustration of how the overall title of specification can be updated again, subject to review, uh, how the description could be made more specific to a given context, uh, the section that grouping multiple APIs could be updated together, uh, could be updated, both title and description. And uh, finally, the operation title and operation description could be modified. Once we're done with the operations, let's take a look at the scenario builder. This, what you see on the screen is the initial step of the scenario builder, where the scenario description can be entered or modified to describe a specific use case. This step allows for providing custom response examples for both successful and erroneous responses. As you can see on the left here is the response being selected, and on the right here is the example file associated with this response. Please note the examples are externalized into files at this step, but you'll see, uh, as you'll see from the next slide, it is possible to paste JSON, direct, JSON content directly into the scenario definition. So files are not the only option. Uh, this screen represents a scenario overview uh, that allows for viewing, editing, and creating new scenarios. Uh, what you see here is the list of the scenarios that already been defined for a given uh, API. Here's the response code supported for each particular scenario. Here's this particular example that refers to this scenario. And uh, 
On the upper right corner, you'll see the two icons that allow for downloading the example if it needs to be downloaded, and also for pasting a specific or overriding example with the um, data that can be pasted or copied and pasted from a different application. Uh, there are actually more steps that might be needed to complete the API specification contextualization. But in the interest of time, let's jump to the most important part of the API definition the payload or schema contextualization. Uh, this is a model of the screen that allows to modify the schema in a library. So we chose one of the most elaborate schemas. Uh, it's only partially shown that represents the entire worker entity. So someone would start with selecting the canonical schema that is, needs to be contextualized. And again, remember, all the canonical or standard templates are used as a basis. So the next would be selecting a context. And again, those contexts could be flexibly selected or it could be already predefined. Remember, that's a screen markup, essentially. Um, next, you would cherry pick the relevant schema elements entities to reflect the actual implementation. And some of them actually not breakable. And this is enforced through the application. Uh, this is kind of similar to GraphQL concept, but it's uh, that's, I think, where similarity ends. Uh, you can update descriptions, you can update constraints, formats, ranges, and again, certain attributes can be overeaten based on the business rules, and these business rules are enforced through the application. Different data types have its own uh, attributes uh, related to them, such as arrays, dates, and numeric attributes, etc. So similar to the way how JSON schema, how JSON schema is structured. And finally, after the schema is contextualized. Uh, where you can save the schema and associate it with the given context. So next time when the application is viewed and uh, somebody is requesting the schema, the contextualized version of the schema would be presented and being and downloadable as opposed to generic schema that may include attributes that are not applicable to a given implementation. And finally, here are a couple of the access management screens. Uh, this one shows the product entitlements assigned to a given user or a group by an API registry administrator. As you can see here is this uh, number of products selected, and those products could, could be a product on their own or a product within a certain geopolitical region. Uh, once the product's access is assigned, the entitlements can be granularized further for a specific user. As you can see on the left side, you see the already assigned. And also in the right column, you see the choice of the products that were assigned on the previous screen that uh, allowed to be assigned on the previous screen. So the entitlements can be further granularized. Summary, let's take a look. The specs are the face and the entry point to your API repository in the face of your API program, essentially. And often, your APIs and API program is judged or misjudged by the way how specs <coughs> look and, most importantly, how accurate they are. Well, consistency of the API contracts is the most important factor of the, in the success of any API program. The usage context could vary. So let's summarize the concepts of the API specs contextualization. Accept the fact that different consumers may require different views of the same API specification, so the specification content can and will differ. API documentation portal can be made context aware and reflect current user entitlements, so the documentation could be tailored to address the specific consumer needs. API provider can define more than one flavor of the same specification based on the predefined context. Again, uh, the providers can have different customer based, and they can decide if their implementation is applicable to this, better applicable to that customer, or better applicable to a different customer. But most importantly, on all this contextualization efforts, uh, the business terms and overall look and feel should be preserved. Remember, consistency is the key. However, looks like uh, while consistency is definitely key, it looks like that as far as the API specification is concerned, the answer is one size does not fit at all. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I think we have a couple minutes should you have any questions. I'll be more than happy to answer.
And if we don't have time for to answer specific questions, you can always reach me uh, at my email at borisvernov at adp.com or connect with me on the LinkedIn. Thank you very much. And let's see if we have any questions. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Boris, for the presentation. Unfortunately, speaking, we're a little bit short on time. We did have some questions. We'll, get, we'll make sure to forward them to you, but we're going to have to move on. Although, people, if you have questions, feel free to use the chat. All the speakers have access to it, and they can follow up. So with that said, thank you very much again, Boris, for the presentation, and we're going to be moving to the next one. You're quite welcome. It's been a pleasure. Have a good one.